Yes, I have this uh, kind of bizarre uh, uh, background. Uh, I, would, I would say, however, that, um, that I wasn't, um, because sometimes I've been introduced as Gorbachev's economic advisor. I was an advisor, I wasn't the advisor, so, so I, I wouldn't take the blame. Uh, <laughs> uh, because if there was something too big to fail, that was Soviet Union, definitely. 11 time zones, yeah, twice bigger than US and Canada combined and completely, completely destroyed by its own government without any external assistance even. <coughs> and so when I defected to the United States, I found myself working for the second largest bureaucracy of this planet for the federal government in Washington, D.C. Well, work for government is uh, kind of an oxymoron, I think. <laughs> but, and uh, I worked for them. <coughs> for the Congressional Think Tank, U.S. Institute of Peace, which like all Congressional Think Tanks, didn't think at all, just period. <laughs> <laughs> we were tanking mostly. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I decided to do something positive with myself, and, uh, and I found a job in Wisconsin, uh, which is even colder than Russia, and uh, <laughs> teaching, teaching young Americans ideas of liberty, ideas of founding fathers of the United States. And uh, as the president of my college is saying that it took him a Moscow trained economist to teach supply and demand because <laughs> all my colleagues are teaching something else like social justice or yesterday, <laughs> yesterday's paper or whatever else yeah, <clears throat> they can find. Okay, so today we will uh, discuss this is a, this year is a hundred anniversary is the centenary of the of the dreadful revolution of the of um, um, uh, in Russia uh, which uh, happened in on the 25th of October uh, 1917 uh, in Russia however everything has a kind of a double meaning the the real time was actually November 7th because they had different calendars and whatnot so they began already with with um, uh, with deceit so <laughs> So why do we need to know about it? Because I think that the people, that people um, forget about, about this revolution. Now today, New York Times has a series of articles praising this stuff. <laughs> Can you imagine? Yes, um, in, I was just recently in, the, uh, in Montclair State University in New Jersey debating three uh, yeah, I was a libertarian, there was a guy, conservative guy from King's College, and there was a communist guy from Montclair State University, Professor Farr, very famous, because he was pointing at me again, saying that I'm not KGB, I'm a CIA, he said. I'm a CIA agent and uh, uh, sent, sent here to, to Montclair State University to fool us that Stalin killed a lot of people. And <laughs> can you imagine, he said, <laughs> and, and I said, well, Stalin didn't kill anyone. He said, no, he didn't. And that was a mistake. And I said, why was that a mistake? Because all the son killed people, bad-mouthed him. Can you imagine? And this guy from 1970, he's destroying young minds in the United States, getting about $140,000 per year for his lies. It's just, just amazing, yes, uh, amazing. Uh, it is crazy, yes. I can tell you that. That the most funny, however, was the, the conservative guy who was completely imbecile. Because, for, ex for example, Professor Farr, his point was that when the United States didn't have oil, then we went to Iraq to, to, to take oil from there. And then when we ran out of drugs, so we invaded Afghanistan to get some <laughs> drugs. And, uh, and, and then. And then, uh, uh, and I asked him, why would we, would we need some drugs? And he said, well, CIA wants to destroy minorities, uh, minorities and progressives with drugs. <laughs> that, <laughs> which, was, uh, which was pretty funny. And then the conservative so-called guy, he said, I think that what I, I I said, well, I, am for, I think the, gun, the drugs should be, should be sold in pharmacies or department stores, and then we will, have, uh, will not have so, so this violence about drugs, and will be drugs of high quality and everything. But, um, <clears throat> but then, then the so-called conservative, he said, uh, you know what he said? I think there is some idea that some people don't know how to handle drugs. And his idea was to, 
to, if you want to have drugs, you need to do your IQ testing. And so if you have IQ below, say, 80, that means you would pay the full price for drugs. <laughs> but then if you have IQ, say, above 110, then you will get a coupon, say, 75% off. <laughs> And, and you can issue this. I, I just couldn't believe it. I, uh, why I'm talking about that? Because there was also students for liberty meeting there. They were, they were doing about that. So returning back to definitely a foundation of any free society can be based only on property rights. Property rights is mother of all rights. James Madison, our president, he made this point that there are no other human rights are possible without property rights, without property rights. It's uh, absolutely understandable. Now then, um, uh, property rights, however, I think that the most, the most, uh, the most important part of it is self-ownership, that you, you, sh you are a free person when you own yourself. If you're somebody else owns you, then you're a slave, you're a slave. And so John Locke, his point was um, uh, that who owns you, who owns you, who owns, fruits of your labor. If you do, you're a free man. If not, you're a slave. And this is as easy as that. So from my perspective, and that's why I'm considered to be kind of like a right-wing fanatic in the United States, because I don't call socialism social, I call it public slavery. It is a public slavery, and people are owned by government. People are owned by government. Government is telling you what to do. Uh, government is making choices, because what is freedom? Freedom is choice, right? nothing else. Freedom is choice. And then we see today our choices are being reduced and reduced, reduced in South Africa, in the United States, everywhere else. But in the Soviet Union, um, you didn't have any choice whatsoever. It was not, uh, uh, it was not part of the, of the problem. So, so that's, I think, that Temba today mentioned this, that what is, uh, what is socialism? Uh, it is abolition of private property. No private property, people owned by their own government. Yeah, so this is, uh, this are the, the, I'll just show you some pictures of this awful revolution. Yeah, and there were people like Trotsky, like Lenin, uh, mass murderers. Um, the, the, uh, Rudy Rammel, he's a professor of demographics in the University of Hawaii, uh, the most famous demographer. He believes that about 200 million people were murdered by the socialist governments. In, um, uh, in the world in the 20th century. In the Soviet Union it, uh, alone, the number is, uh, which was confirmed by the KGB, 43 million people. We had a KGB boss, was, uh, um, you, you remember maybe Mr. Gorbachev, uh, that's the, uh, my, my former boss, he had this, um, <laughs> this uh, policy of perestroika. And collateral to this perestroika was policy of glasnost. Policy of Glasnost was. Uh, a little bit, yeah. Uh -huh. This is Cuba, yeah. This is a, <laughs> this is ambulance in Cuba. I'm shocked that actually we can't even emulate the siren. Yeah, what I wanted to show you there. Yes. Yeah. So one, <laughs> 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 one way. Uh, the policy policy of glasnost was uh, introduced by Gorbachev uh, after Chernobyl, after Chern because he 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 made a point. That we were very sorry for everything because Mr. Gorbachev he said, "I only found the truth on the fifth day," that he was not even told about what happened in Chernobyl. And, uh, and he didn't know whatever. And I was speaking at American Medical Association and they had a conference of doctors for, doctors for emergency preparedness. And so they asked me to do this Chernobyl thing. And, uh, <coughs> and I looked into archives already available that Mr. Gorbachev knew everything from the very beginning. He had a Politburo, they had a secret Politburo meeting 20 minutes after it happened in the middle of the night of, of April 26. And he made wonderful decisions to send 700,000 troops. Can you imagine, 700,000 troops in brand new uniforms with brand new AK-47s went there to fight radiation. And, 
and <laughs> without anything, without without brooms, without without showers, without whatever. So that was one wonderful decision. Another wonderful decision was that Mr. Gorbachev decided that we don't have enough meat. So all the radio radioactive stuff was not thrown out or, or buried, that's what should be done definitely, uh, but it was mixed with good. So the standards would be pretty kind of low. Now, because I, I'm the last speaker, looks like, so I will maybe jump from one point, point to another because um, now there are certain things. I am too lazy to write a book uh, about, <laughs> about uh, but I, I witnessed some very interesting episodes of history. So, for example, Mr. Gorbachev, um, uh, he was sharing one of the meetings on economic reforms. He said, he said comrades, this is, uh, this is untrue that central planning uh, doesn't work. Uh, we have some economists who insist central planning doesn't work. No, the problem is that we never had a good plan. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> And then you would think whether he is an idiot or, <laughs> or, or what's going on, yes. <laughs> Another time, today we had a nice presentation, I think, um, on, um, uh, Pete mentioned uh, uh, Sweden, yes, and the Swedish model and everything. And, uh, and I remember we had a, um, uh, also another economist, we called him the biggest economist in the world, Abela Ganbigyan, a friend of Gorbachev. He was maybe 400 pounds, the really big economist. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> even bigger than me. And, uh, and, uh, and so Mr. Ganbigyan, he, he once, he rose and he said, I think what we need to do in Soviet Union, we need to build a Swedish model of socialism. And Gorbachev looked at him, he said, Abel, where you would get the Swedes? <laughs> and, and, and that was exactly, exactly what happened. No Swedes and it all fell apart. And <coughs> um, uh, so I will return, return back. Yeah, I can, I can, if, you, if anyone is interested in this, send me an email, I'll email you back this, this presentation. Yeah, so, so one thing I think that many people don't understand, it just occurred to me, speaking about Chernobyl, that look, Russian eagle is double-headed as well. <laughs> Way before, yeah, yeah. So. That's the, yeah, so, <clears throat> Kind of my, I have the simple, so my son right now is in, uh, he's 14, he is in Washington DC on the conference Turning Point, it's, it's a sister organization to, to Students for Liberty, and he's 14, he has this wonderful t-shirt with Uncle Sam pointing, you know, Uncle Sam, I want you to the US Army, and he has this, this Uncle Sam saying, I want you to stay home. <laughs> 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 That's uh, very, very good, yeah, so, <clears throat> so returning back to, to uh, this public slavery issue. Um, what they did, I mean, what Lenin, what the genius of Lenin uh, prompted, that he realized that the only way to keep power is to kill. To kill, to kill, and to kill. And the more you kill, the better off you are, definitely. Uh, I'm working on a, in the archives, in the Library of Congress, ar archives of Soviet general Dmitry Volkogonov. Uh, Volkogonov was a propaganda hitman of the Soviet Union, and any time I would see him, I would switch the TV right away because he was he was a liar. He was just unbelievable, uh, 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 very difficult to to I mean even just to listen to him. And I didn't know, and I would never expect that in 1980 he bought. A, a Xerox machine in, in Austria, put it in, his, in the back room in his, in his office, and was making highly illegal copies of everything going through his table. And he was commander of Soviet Institute of Military History. So he accumulated 46 boxes of, of secret, the most classified secret materials possible and impossible. And if they would know, if they would find it out, he would be shot on the spot. They wouldn't, 
they wouldn't really kind of have any formalities with court proceedings or things like that. Yeah, so he would be, and now this is, a, uh, and so when Soviet Union fell apart, he approached U.S. ambassador in Moscow, and uh, he said, I want it out of Soviet Union because KGB will come back to power, and it did with Mr. Putin at the helm. And, um, <clears throat> and so he went to all these 46 boxes to move to the United States. And ambassador said, oh, of course, we will, I will uh, put you in contact with, with people in the agency, that means with CIA. And he said, no agency, please, um, Library of Congress, and if, and if the agency wants to read it, get a reader's card from the library <laughs> and, uh, and read it there. And I don't think CIA got any reader's card, but I did, and I am the only one, looks like, unfortunately, who is, who is in these archives. This is enough information, enough, enough data for, for 5,000 doctor dissertations, for, for a lot of books, for everything. It's just amazing telling you what they think. For example, Lenin, Lenin um, uh, Lenin's uh, handwritten memos and everything. A commissar from southern Russia is writing, Dear Comrade Lenin, you told us to fight religion, you didn't explain how. Lenin is writing him back, Dear Comrade Imbecile, <laughs> murder religious people, that's how, Lenin, postscript, and murder them the way everybody, everybody would tremble with fear 150 miles around. Post postscript, administer communion with lead, can you imagine, they would, they would have boiling lead administering communion to priests, his point is, to priests, nuns, monks, that's how. Yeah, so that's, that's how we should fight religion, definitely. Why they were fighting religion? Uh, religion was considered to be, well, the opium of the people. That's the, that's the Marxist uh, definition of religion. That religion was kind of like invented to keep slaves of capitalism. Um, and, the, and the lead, and, um, and so religion was, uh, from another hand, because I, I was pretty much uh, in Soviet Union, uh, uh, we studied Marx, it was like a madrasa, um, Marxist madrasa, so we, we were kind of learning it almost by heart, and, um, and uh, according to Marx, and he was absolutely right, that you cannot be a communist if you believe in, in God. In any God, if you believe in God, there is just no room for, for to believe that Comrade Lenin is the greatest or Comrade Stalin is a kind of like a real God is yes and what not. And so that's the, and, and all religions were exterminated. They had equal opportunity, mm -hmm. hatred towards Islam, towards Judaism, towards Christianity. Maybe Catholics were the most prosecuted. Um, Stalin's secretary, private secretary, he, he wrote that Stalin couldn't sleep even uh, with his completely uh, unbelievable, unlimited hatred towards Catholics. And why Catholics? Because uh, his secretary said, uh, well, who, who cares? I mean, there's no God, then, then why, why would you be so, so upset? I mean, I mean, there's no God, you know about it. So and there are some people. And his point was that, uh, yeah, there's no God. I'm no, I don't care about God. I am care about the son of a bitch in Rome. <laughs> yeah, that was his, his point. Yeah. And uh, so that for Catholics, definitely the Pope would be above Stalin. And he couldn't sleep nights because there is somebody who pretends that, that, that uh, he is above above Mr. Stalin. So, so the religion was number one, definitely, and they murdered 900,000 priests and um, nuns and monks and other people. Um, 900,000, that's, that's the number again confirmed by the KGB. In 1929, uh, they didn't have bullets already, and so the, uh, Stalin decriminalized killings of so-called cleaning of social vermin, he called it. So that means that anyone could go and kill the priest and rape his wife and take whatever they have and loot the church and the, and the police only would say thank you so much for cleaning the social vermin away. So that was, yeah, so that was how religion was prohibited, completely prohibited until 1942. In 1942, after one and a half million defectors from the Soviet army to Germans, 
the Stalin decided that he, he thought that they, he's losing the war, losing the war, and only then, because a lot of these defectors were religious people, because they believed that Stalin is antichrist, antichrist, and so that's, that's, um, uh, that's how he legalized religion. But legalized religion was, again, was religion run by the special, special department of the KGB was in charge of this. And uh, if anyone is interested in that, I wrote a obituary for Alexis II, who was the, the patriarch of Russia. Patriarch is like, like pope for, for Russian Orthodox. Um, and uh, so it's, it's all over the internet, I think, right now. And, uh, and I looked into his life, Alexis II. He was a colonel of the KGB. Can you imagine? He was selling his flock to KGB kind of wholesale and retail and did everything like that. He's, uh, he's wanted in the Republic of Estonia for crimes against humanity and things like that. He, and he was the, he was the, the patriarch who the, he died maybe five, six years ago. And, um, and then they had so-called free elections of the new patriarch, the first elections after the Tsar's time. Uh, they had, and they had four people who were competing with each other to be elected as a patriarch of Russian Orthodox Church. And amazingly enough, I looked into that and I called, I have a sleeper cell in Moscow, so I called, I called this, the, the people I know, my friends, and, and they admitted that, that all four were K, are KGB agents. So you have, <laughs> you have a, a kind of a healthy competition inside the KGB. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so these are the, the numbers, uh, say 43 million, Solzhenitsyn Foundation believes that 61 million people murdered by, by Soviet government. Um, I have to tell the truth, I don't even care how many, because both numbers are completely outside of my, of the, I think, the, the human understanding of evil. And, and Temba today, he, he quoted Stalin, who used to say, death of one is a tragedy, death of a million just statistic. It's not million tragedies, just statistics, nothing else. Yeah, so, so anywhere from, again, from 40, 43 million, uh, we had um, this Mr. Krichkov, who was a part of this, of this uh, glasnost. He was the chairman of the KGB. And they put him on the spot on TV. Uh, I think Mr. Gorbachev probably ordered him there. And uh, <coughs> it was one of the callers, a call-in program, which was unheard of in Soviet Union before. <laughs> because everything was pre-taped like several months before, then approved by five committees and 10 commissions, and then only shown to the public. And, and then, uh, and he was there on the uh, kind of, uh, uh, he referred, referred, because I was at the one meeting he was there, he referred to that experience, he said, I was like naked amidst the pack of wolves. And he called the, 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 his experience on, on TV. And one person called and he said, uh, this person, he said, um, I calculated 43 million people were murdered by your agency. And uh, Mr. Krushkov, he said, uh, I don't know, uh, why should I know? Um, give me some time. He said, what if ex exactly a week from now, I'll be again on this program and tell you w w the, the true number. And so a week, uh, next week, the whole, it was like, it was like a, hockey championship, I mean, no people in the streets, everybody glued to TV screens to find out how many millions of skeletons you have in your cupboard. And, uh, and Mr. Krichkov, he said, well, comrades, he said, the number is about right, he said, but, but it's preposterous to, to insist that all these people were killed. Most of them died of natural causes. And, uh, and the moderator, nice young lady, she had enough courage, she said, well, if you don't feed people, they die of natural causes. If you don't, if you don't clothe them in Siberia, they die of natural causes, and and on and on like that. So, so that's exactly what uh, what uh, happened. In uh, other communist countries, China is a mega murderer. Seventy-eight million people. They had, uh, um, they had. Uh, uh, besides that, on the top of that, there is a grand famine. Grand Famine was engineered by Chinese government from 1962 to 1964. 48 million people starved to death. Mao was laughing all the time, saying that, look, I mean, they're all cannibals. They're all cannibals. Yeah, because there was, uh, cannibalism, was, uh, cannibalism was, was widespread in, in Ukraine, famine, 1932, 1933. In China, 
All famines usually would result in that, but these were government-organized famines. If you have time or desire, you can watch uh, a video called The Soviet Story. This is the most gruesome documentary about socialism produced by in the former Soviet Republic of Latvia because KGB and Soviet Army uh, were so afraid of Latvians, so they ran away and left all the archives and everything in uh, Riga intact. And so they have this. This is, a, this is just a, a great... I usually would take my students to Cuba to inoculate them against socialism. Because <laughs> you, you go to Cuba, you see this disaster, and, and you never can believe in this. Um, and interestingly enough, a lot of my students, um, they would get a, enough money immediately from their parents who were hippies or who are still communists or whatever. So for many of them, it's like Hajj. It's kind of like they, <laughs> and, and I remember I was flying to Havana, sitting next to a young woman, and she was saying, oh, yes, my, 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 my parents, they just love it, whatever. They want me to bring pictures of, of Fidel, of Che Guevara, of Raul. Um, I was kind of... <laughs> I already was saying, like, you can become rich opening a shooting range, but <laughs> then I caught myself, whatever, uh, that I wouldn't. And so she looked at the uh, Cuba, whatever. I'm flying back with the same ticket. I mean, she's sitting next, and I, I didn't communicate with her in Cuba. And I said, well, how did you like it? She said, never been to a place where every woman is a prostitute and every man is a thief. <laughs> I thought... I saw that educational mileage was pretty good. <laughs> of this. Yeah, so this is the, um, speaking about Cuba, then um, I have a friend there, Cuban. Um, uh, he asked me never to reveal his name because I know him since Moscow times because they, they, um, uh, uh, they would send a lot of young people to Moscow from Cuba to brainwash them. And in most cases, brains would be washed together with water, but in his case, they were not. So he's very smart, whatever. He's, he's up there in the government, and so he spoke to my group, and one of the students, um, she was um, under the influence of this uh, video called Sico. I don't know if you heard of that. Sico by... by um, uh, What's Michael? Yeah, uh, who, is the, who is the biggest propaganda person? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and he, and he um, uh, yes, and he presented that in Cuba they have a great, great, great uh, health care. And so she, was, she, she saw this and she said, this is such a disaster, everything is falling apart, but we heard you have the best health care system in the world. He said, of course we do, of course we do. But as a true communist, he said, we need to see the room for improvement. If we would have doctors, medicines, <laughs> clinics, hospitals, ambulances, it would be just perfect. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then we are walking out of the room, and he, in Russian, he said, healthcare, healthcare, swim to Miami. That's the only healthcare I know of. <laughs> that was, uh, yeah, so, so I um, usually use that, but then I was arrested the last time I was in Cuba. And, um, and, and that's why I just don't go there anymore. And, <laughs> and the next, to, next to it is, is Soviet story. So if you don't go to Cuba to inoculate your loved ones uh, against Bacillus of communism, then you, can, then you can watch Soviet story. Soviet story. And you can watch uh, Soviet story, by the way, on, uh, for free on the World Wide Web. And um, I just Google it, or it's, on, I think, on YouTube and everywhere else. Uh, so this is this. Why do they kill? Why do they? Why do they kill? That many people don't understand that. Why would you need to kill? Why all socialist country kills? Very simple explanation. They don't have any incentives. I mean, if you have socialism, you don't have any incentives to do anything. If, for example, if you all be paid the same, no matter what you do or don't do. Then, what? Then, then usually people stop working at all. And if you are a great leader and you want them to do what you want them to do, then you need to kill. Then you need to, because you don't have positive extensive incentives, you need to create negative incentives. And negative fear is a very powerful incentive. Very powerful. And the more you kill, the more 
you achieve. And that was uh, Lenin again in 1922 in the same archives. He is writing to Dzerzhinsky, founder of, K of KGB, of Chekai at that time. He's saying, dear, dear Felix, I'm telling comrades what to do. Nobody listens. I am tired of that. Let's take a couple of absent-minded comrades and shoot them publicly. And when they did, they realized the attention span increases. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and the highest rates of economic growth in the Soviet Union was achieved from 1935 to 1939, when they were murdering people with a speed of 1,500 a day. 1,500 a day. That was the, this, that was this, this uh, meat grinding machine was at, at, at its fastest, including my grandfather was, uh, was murdered as well. So that's every, almost every Soviet family lost loved ones. Um, because it was more even than the Second World War, I mean, this mass murder. So that's why they killed. That's it's inevitable, inevitable. First Soviet government was the most enlightened government. Trotsky was writing poetry in French. Uh, Lenin could play piano and spoke seven languages. And no, 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 like that. And that's the logic of the utopia they were trying to introduce that made them mass murderers. Because, and Lenin was writing very openly. He was saying, from, tsar, from Tsars, we inherited very poor human material. So how, that's how he called people. Um, very poor human material, which can be mended only by mass shootings and forced labor. That's what his, uh, his point was. And why Soviet Union collapsed? Because Mr. Gorbachev inadvertently removed fear out of the system, which was glued together only by fear. So and he was talking like a parrot. He was talking about social with human face. And he was thinking, what is that? And he was saying that, Le that Stalin, he perverted the image of socialism. Socialism is the most humane society. It would be a natural choice of humankind if Stalin would not make it uh, this unpleasant and deadly. And so his point was we should return back to human, human face of socialism. And <clears throat> Um, just to make long story short, uh, there's a good joke which of that time which illustrates uh, illustrates uh, this 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 thesis of Mr. Gorbachev, and the joke is that um, that CIA didn't know what's happening in in Soviet Union, uh, what is perestroika, what are all these reforms about, and so they uh, they found out that James Bond is retired in London, and so they hired James Bond and sent James to Moscow to find out what's happening. And James is walking with a little notebook um, in different stores. He goes to a butcher shop, writes there, no meat, goes to the bakery, and no bread, goes to the shoe store, no shoes. And there is a KGB officer looking over his shoulder, and he said, a year ago, you would be shot for doing that. He writes there, no bullets. <laughs> and, then, and, and, that's, uh, and, when, and when people realize that there's no bullets, then the, Sure enough, everybody stopped working. Yeah, I mean that was that you could see that it's almost overnight everybody stopped working. I had a I had a secretary, Elena, a very nice young lady, and she was um, once I saw she stealing paper clips, putting paper clips into her purse. I said, Lena, why are you stealing state property in such strange form, paper clips? <laughs> she said, Yuri, point to me. What else can I take in this F office? <laughs> Just, I'll take that, nothing, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and that was right. And so I was, I remember walking home thinking that if the youngest and brightest are going to work only to steal something, that society is definitely doomed, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, so I came to that idea maybe seven years before the CIA learned about the demise of Soviet Union from Washington Post. That's the, uh, that's the, <laughs> that uh, <laughs> was, <laughs> Yeah, compost. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> Fake news center. <laughs> we have we have these elections as the gift which keeps on giving. It was just, it's just amazing. The whole country. I mean, this is um, every day you you, you 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 look for what's what really happened. Yeah. And we have all these uh, wonderful clowns like Mr. Scaramucci. <laughs> he sounds like a James Bond character. Yeah. And, <laughs> Yeah, so but returning back to them, then, then you, you need to kill. If you don't kill, they are out. And that's why North Korea is still in. They kill. Cuba is in. 
because they kill. They understand what it is. Uh, those who didn't are gone. Yeah. So is Mr. Gorbachev and, and everybody else. And so this is the problem, however, with, with the social, that it's not only kills people. It destroys those who are still alive. And destroys because for many people, slavery is attractive. Because if you are a slave, you don't need to make decisions. You don't need to make choices. Moreover, you don't have a feeling of responsibility. If you are being told, do this, don't do that, then who cares? I mean, that's the, and uh, in Russia today, it's a, it's a widespread pandemic, I would say, alcoholism. People are going into what they call internal exile, you know, just all the time deliriously drunk and, and whatnot. So these are the kind of the problems, uh, real problems of, of, of socialism. Socialism corrupts. I am using the word socialism, I don't use the word communism, because communism never existed. Uh, some of my colleagues in, say, in, in American academia, mo most of them would say, uh, would say socialism is actually good, communism is bad, or fascism is bad. Yeah, it's a, it's a, but what is communism? Communism is a, <coughs> yes, this is communism. This is from, uh, from Communist Manifesto. In communist society, nobody has one exclusive. This is a paradise. The state would wither away. There will be no money. People would be working for the fun of working for others. And they would work as, as hard as they possibly can. And they consume as little as they possibly can. They will be real angels. And you don't need even government. You don't need a state because people will self-govern themselves. That's what, we need to create this man, new man of tomorrow, new man of tomorrow. That's Hitler borrowed from Marx, and, the, and uh, again, this new man of tomorrow. Um, and, and that would be this, this, this communist angels. Um, and Engels, his buddy, he asked him, uh, when does he think this communism would be available? And, um, and Marx said, not earlier than 500 years from now. So we still have, uh, we still are on a 300 years waiting list for, <laughs> for that <laughs> kind of wonderful thing. So, so it was never, it never happened. This, this kind of society, uh, this kind of, it's amazing that it's exactly the opposite from Adam Smith, right? Exactly the opposite, it's just uh, uh, amazing. Um, <clears throat> so this, um, uh, this is what, then the third type of socialism is national socialism. National socialism uh, is, I have, I have like everything here. Oh yeah, this is, I think I showed it last time. Oh, oh, Soviet, uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Russians and technology, not, uh, not go, go yeah. And what do I want to show? Yeah, oh yeah, this is, I don't know if you saw this. <laughs> Yeah, it was a nice guy. Yes, nice guy. He had a, he had three kids out of wedlock. He was drinking, whatever. Yeah, then in 1915, and then uh, after that became a, became a, a, a man eater. Yeah, that's just unbelievable. Oh, this is nice. <laughs> this is a, <laughs> this is a, yeah. This is the most famous dictum I think of Hayek. Is there a greater tragedy imaginable than that in our endeavor consciously to shape our future? In accordance with high ideals, we should, in fact, unwillingly produce the very opposite of what we have been striving. And this is wrong, Hayek. This is this is this is. <laughs> it's just uh, because it's the last speech, so that's why. I mean, this is Selma Hayek. That's uh, <laughs> this is a uh, this is a uh, wrong. <laughs> but that's not he, this is. What? Yeah, one Mises he talked about two different types of socialism. Uh, the Soviet type, Russian pattern, uh, when everything belongs to the state, everything is nationalized. In Soviet Union, even shoeshine stand will be run by a bureaucrat. I mean, that was no private property, period. In the, and so this is the Russian pattern. And the Nazi pattern would be the socialist German pattern. Preserves private property. It's, uh, it's more or less kind of like, like we talked about that today, Quite a, quite a lot that, that the government, the government de facto rules you. That it's central planning without 
with, our, uh, uh, with property rights, nominal property rights. Uh, but this property rights, you will have a title that uh, in the United States will have what wetlands, for example. You, you have a title for wetlands, you know, but you can't even camp there yourself. It's just you, <laughs> you'll be arrested for trespassing. And, uh, and so the government is telling you when to open, when to close, whom to fire, whom to hire, everything, what prices to pay, what prices to charge. So that was central planning with, um, and it's a fascist economy. I think most economies of the West right now are moving with a full speed to this fascist model of uh, economic, economic system. So this, uh, the <laughs> this is like welfare state. We also talked about uh, about welfare state, because what is welfare state? It's a, uh, uh, it's a transition. This is the worst thing about that, that it's transition. It, it will lead, inevitably lead, to, to socialism. That's what Lenin used to say, that, that democracy, logically, logically extended democracy, would inevitably result in socialism. So what does this mean? That means if all of us can outward timber of his possessions, then many people would do that, right? just democratically, because rich people are what? Rich people are minority, yeah, minority. So, so then you, you kind of, uh, uh, that's the, yeah, these are all these awful pictures. Yeah. This is Cuba, this is, uh, this is a store in Cuba, as I took this picture myself, the store in Cuba. Everything else is on, you can buy everything else only, oh, this is some, somewhere there is this rations, the, the uh, list of what you can buy. Here is the only thing you can buy is baking soda, that's this, without, <laughs> <laughs> I made a stupid joke that I said that you, you guys should should appoint people who are in charge of baking soda in charge of everything. And, <laughs> and, and uh, it was almost punished for that. <laughs> uh, so these are uh, the, the poor Cuban, these are uh, fixer uppers there. Uh, since 1959, they didn't invest anything in, in housing stock. Can you imagine? And this, this is all falling apart. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is pretty funny, it's a Chinese billionaire. Uh, uh, he was a Marxist, I mean, raised as Marxist, uh, and um, uh, Marx and Lenin, they hated gold. All governments hate gold, gold is, yeah, so, so then uh, Lenin used to say that what we will do when, when, when we will win, uh, we will make toilet commodes out of gold, because gold does not corrode, it's, it's a natural, uh, natural uh, 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 metal for toilet equipment, that was his, <laughs> his point. And this Chinese billionaire, he, he made this as a conversation topic, um, uh, but amazingly enough, gold, um, he paid $2.7 million to make it, now the price for that is $42 million. So gold is pretty, paid it back very well. Yeah. <laughs> so this is... Um, So these are the mass murderers of its wars. Yeah. Uh, Grigory Zinov, he was the first president of Comintern, of Comintern. Look what he would say. To overcome our enemy, we must have a, our own socialist militarism. We must carry along with us 90 million out of the 100 million of Soviet Russia's population. As for the rest, we have nothing to say to them. They must be annihilated. And that, well, he was annihilated in 1936 himself, yes, and Stalin was, uh, you can imagine, Stalin killed his friends and his family first. And he had this, uh, this wonderful kind of little room with a, with a curtain, and he was laughing all the time how Zinoviev, this, um, this monster, how he was uh, kissing the boots of the officer who was shooting at him uh, and, and begging for, for survival. So this is just awful, I mean, they're all like, all like this, yeah. Um, so if you look at Hitler, yeah, it's the same, the same thing, yeah. I think, where is this? There's an interesting speech of Hitler I usually would show and would say, who said that without saying this is Hitler, yeah. And Hitler is saying like, we're socialists, all of us socialists. We believe that uh, humans should be judged on their on the, uh, the character, not 
not by, by the, the productivity which is understood by capitalists only. And no, 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 like that. So, so that was, uh, there was another socialist. And, and again, the Soviet story will tell you, uh, 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 will tell you the details how they work together. Because you remember maybe in 1939, both of these monsters, Stalin and Hitler, they, um, they were united in their fight against so-called fascist Poland. And they, and they divided Poland, they divided Poland. They, they took over Baltic states and whatnot. And before I will, I think I have depressed you already for enough for, for, for this wonderful Saturday, but to have something positive to say, um, uh, I can tell you a little bit about, say, Baltic states, about some, because when Soviet Union collapsed on the glorious night of 24th of December of 1992, when it collapsed, then uh, 15 countries emerged out of, it collapsed also, many people don't understand how it, why it collapsed. It collapsed because Yeltsin at that time, I had a dubious pleasure of working with him as well. And, uh, and, and Mr. Yeltsin, he declared independence of Russia, independence of Russia from the Soviet Union. So that was the end of, because you remember, the, I mean, Russia is, is in the middle, so it would be like if, Continental U.S. would declare independence from U.S. and say only Puerto Rico and Guam would try to stick, to stick, <laughs> to, uh, to stick together. <laughs> so that's the, the, and so interesting. Why it's very interesting? Because 15 countries with more or less the same background, with the same history of, of socialist destruction, um, they, they, they tried to get out of the socialist slavery, finding their own ways. And sure enough, those who have chosen freedom, they, they are doing very well. If you look at Baltic states, uh, in Estonia, for example, standard of living right now, $36,000 GDP per capita. Uh, in Lithuania, $28,000. Latvia, $26,000. In Russia, $8,000. In Ukraine, $4,000. And if you look at countries like Turkmenistan, $1,000. And and the starting point was about 2000 in 1990. So, so that was that uh, uh, you can say some people in the life of one generation increased their incomes by 18 times. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And, and these are the most, uh, and I can, what if I will just <coughs> personally tell you the story of Estonia. Estonia is a, I wrote several articles about Estonia with self-descriptive titles, a little country that could, or <laughs> the best government in the world, and things like that. Um, and um, uh, I was, uh, uh, gave a talk at the Milwaukee Business Club, and was saying, um, you guys, we want to invest, invest in Costa Rica, in Thailand, don't invest in Russia, because uh, I never saw a person, to tell the truth, never saw a person, who made an honest buck there. I saw some people who have stolen a lot. I mean, that was, that's kind of doable. <laughs> but, uh, but honest buck, no. And, uh, <clears throat> and then and there was one person, an obnoxious person. He would stand up and would say, but you cannot ignore this market. It's a big market, 140 million people. I said, why, not? why, why you cannot ignore? You can ignore whatever you want to ignore. Um, and, <laughs> and then next morning, the phone rings. I, uh, I recognize this person, this his voice, and he said, I am vice president of Kikaman Foods. You know, Kikaman is uh, soy sauce, soy sauce uh, people, soy sauce, yes. And they have a chain of uh, um, Japanese restaurants in Europe and in Asia. He calls me, he said, I am vice president of Kikaman Foods USA, and um, we decided to go to Russia, and we would like to hire you as a consultant. And I said, you probably couldn't understand my accent or what, I mean, because my message was, don't go there. And, <laughs> and he, he said, uh, we think you are very level-headed, and we want you to, how much do you charge per hour? And, and I didn't know how much, I mean, I, I didn't want to scare him. I said, uh, how about $35 per hour? And it was like a long pause, he said, can we make it 100 at least? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I said, I said uh, uh, you don't know, maybe I'm a slow worker. He said, completely irrelevant. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and so, um, 
And at that time, I, and I told him, how about instead of going to Russia, let's go to Lithuania. He said, Lithuania, can you imagine, US, US businessman. He said, Lithuania sounds like a cold medicine. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I said, well, how about Estonia? He said, Estonia, what is that? And I said, this whole country is uh, former Soviet Union. He said, oh, you, you do, we hired you already. You write us a business proposal, and we will go to wherever you lead us. And so I decided to go to Estonia. And can you imagine, it's, uh, it's really why I'm talking about that so long, because they had a, the most libertarian government at that time in the world. So I decided I called the reference uh, uh, table in Tallinn and um, I got a phone number for prime minister's office. Calling prime minister uh, office and his, his secretary said, my English is not very good, what if I'll put you through? <laughs> and so the, the prime minister picking up the phone and, and I said, my name is Yuri Maltz, if I'm calling from Wisconsin. He said, great place to call from with a name like yours. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately, he said that, yeah. I said, well, we, I'm representing Kikaman Food, soy sauce company. He said, so what is that? And I said, we will bring you soy sauce. He said, uh, you want to meet with me? I said, yeah, why not? He said, okay, why not? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, gave me a, a date, yeah, and I still remember, 10 o'clock in the morning at, uh, on August 6th. And so we're arriving there, and everybody from Kikaman, from Tokyo, because if you're meeting with the head of government, then then the whole, the, the whole leadership of the Hickman also arrived. So I'm um, meeting with Prime Minister. He was 32. He became Prime Minister when he was 29. And he is, uh, yes, uh, and he um, is sitting there, whatever, and said, well, you know what he said? When I became Prime Minister, I found out that we have $24,000 only in the Treasury. And the full basement of Soviet, of Soviet rubles, was, I wish just pictures of Lenin. And, uh, and, <laughs> and he said, so what could we do? What could we do with $24,000 for the country? Uh, so we legalized prostitution, gambling, firearms right away. Now you can buy firearms, he said, at the toy store or the gas station without showing your driver's license. <laughs> and, and Mr. Kikaman, uh, Mr. Mr. Someya was president of Kikaman. He, he just repeated the last sentence. He said, why without driver's license? And, and can you imagine, Prime Minister, he said, pedestrians, sir, can be pissed off as well. <laughs> that was, <laughs> and, and, then, and then the most, the most funny thing, he said, uh, armed society is a polite society. That's a famous, uh, famous dictum. Um, armed society, polite society. And, and again, Mr. Sami said, why? And he said, why? Why not? I mean, he said, if you were, now, for example, you came here, and look, I put, we put some apples for you, and notebooks, and, and pencils, uh, but I would be even nicer if you would come with Uzi machine guns. <laughs> that was, <laughs> and then Mr. Same, this Japanese uh, um, uh, businessman, he kind of, he said, this is a stand-up prime minister. You know, stand-up comedian, yeah. <laughs> stand-up <laughs> stand prime minister. But what was great about this, that he immediately, I mean, when he, when he legalized markets, the crime in Estonia dropped 85% in three weeks. All these pimps, all these dealers, whatever, they just took off, went to, to Russia, to, to Ukraine, to whatever else. Yeah. Prostitution was rampant in Estonia because they had a sex tourism from Scandinavia, from Germany. Uh, it all went into yellow pages. <laughs> no, no people anymore. Yeah, just people. Uh, yes, they, and uh, so everything went right. It was just amazing. I, I, I told, I said, Mr. Lahr, the Prime Minister, Mr. Lahr, why, if you are such a libertarian, why wouldn't you legalize drugs? He said, I, I wanted to, but I got phone calls from U.S. and British ambassadors. They said, you have a Russian bear behind your back. Uh, why would you like to spoil your relations with the West? So he said, we didn't legalize drugs, but I can reveal a well-kept state secret that we don't prosecute for drugs either. And, <laughs> and then, and then uh, um, my, my Japanese uh, uh, clients, they said, uh, uh, why, drugs are bad, one, one, one guy said. And the prime minister looked at his big blue eyes, he said, really, really? I never tried them. Yeah, never tried them. <laughs> 
that I don't know. I know some people like them very, very much. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, uh, and sure enough, they went, they had the economic growth around 9%, 10% a year. And Estonia right now is, uh, is became as what Mark Lahr wanted to make it, uh, a boring European country, with, um, uh, 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 and that's what it is today. The same, uh, Latvians and, Estonia and Lithuanians, they were just translating Estonian laws into their own languages, and, and they, they, they have something, they, they call it the development lag. It takes three, four months to translate, so. <laughs> <laughs> And so there's, uh, there's other countries, yeah, countries which with, with very high standard of living and, and, and kind of very good. Uh, with other countries where they say it's very difficult to do statistics, we cannot even, no, I mean, as, as Austrian economist, I don't trust statistics much in general, but, uh, but especially it was in Soviet Union, that was pretty funny, that um, um, Laura D'Andrea Tyson, she later became, uh, Clinton's uh, chief economic advisor. She wrote a book, I remember, Minister of Labor gave me this book and he said, uh, can you read this book and tell us what's about it? It said, Comparative Economies of Eastern Europe, in which she praised Romania of Ceausescu, the country with the greatest, highest rates of economic growth. Um, they had like 12, 14%. And I, at that time, did some consulting for Comic-Con, which was, Council for Mutual Economic Development, that's a Soviet-run kind of, we called it Council for Mutual Economic Destruction. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and I worked with, there was a Romanian guy, Iona Draculescu, everybody called him Dracula, <laughs> naturally. <laughs> and he was a great guy, he would smell alcohol at eight o'clock already in the morning. <laughs> and, and I said, um, Iona, how do you fake statistics? I mean, these Americans, looking at your statistics, thinking you are the most successful. He said, uh, we don't fake statistics. And I said, well, you're a friend. He said, no, we make statistics. <laughs> I, I said, what's the difference? He said, the difference is that to fake that you need statistics and you fake it. <laughs> and to me, you're making it from scratch. I said, <laughs> I said well, what do you mean? He said, well, you look at the ceiling and then you see numbers and you take them down, go to your boss and he would correct you. That's how statistics was, <laughs> was made. I said, well, I'm looking at the ceiling. I don't see anything. He said, I'll have another drink. That was, uh, <laughs> and that was uh, yes. And at that time, I remember when I defected, I was, I was debriefed by all intelligence agencies of the world, of, of the West. Uh, many of them were just had no intelligence whatsoever. <laughs> and, and then when I already was in, in Washington, D.C., I got a call from Dick Cheney. At that time, he was Secretary of Defense. And uh, his secretary invited me to meet with, with, with Secretary Cheney. And so when I came to Mr. Cheney, because I had my own statistics, I tried to rec recalculate Soviet statistics. And I believe that Soviet economy is 6 to 7% of the US economy. And CIA believed it's 65%. And so Mr. Cheney, he's sitting there with his folder, with the, I think that was protocols of my debriefings. And he said, um, he said, um, see how you think it's 65, you think it's six to seven. I would presume the truth is somewhere in between. I said, exactly, Mr. Secretary, it's between six and seven percent. <laughs> and, uh, and, he, and his reaction was completely unexpected. He smiled ear to ear and he said, sweet. <laughs> which was, which was uh, and then at the end, yeah, and then he was saying, it's cosmetics, all these reforms, cosmetics. And, so what kind of cosmetics is that as the patient is dead and the, and the corpse is stinking? And, and <laughs> he, he said, thank you for defecting to the United States. <laughs> His point was, now that's the same thing as, as my girlfriend would say in Washington after I will wash the dishes or I'll do something else. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, it's, uh, it was a very interesting time, definitely. But the 100th anniversary is... Uh, is, a, is definitely a great reminder for us about this murders, about inevitability. I mean, look, Venezuela is unraveling today. The kind, I just was in Brazil, another victim of the same disease. Just, just it's, 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 it's awful what is happening. And the only, Russians cheerfully would say that the only lesson of history is that that does not teach us anything. And this is the only lesson, yes, that does not teach us anything. The Marxism is on the rise in the United States. Can you imagine that Bernie Sanders, this neo-fascist, yeah, is a, 
He was proudly, he was proud socialist. He was, uh, he was all time bragging that he, is, he had a Soviet flag, still has a Soviet flag in, in, the, in, his, in his office. Yeah. And he, it was given to him, he was a mayor of a little town in Vermont, and he went to Soviet Union, they gave him the flag. Yeah. So he went on his honeymoon, he went to Soviet Union. Can you imagine? <laughs> his honeymoon. His, uh, his wife is, uh, uh, he is kind of. Leninist and she is Maoist, and uh, so they, they, have, they have vivid discussions. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> so we have this. We have a Pew, um, Pew public opinion uh, uh, company um, is telling us that 60% of American students prefer socialism to capitalism. Uh, that's the well, Pew, I don't trust them much, Pew as well. well. Lenin used to say, public opinion polls are not about what people think, it's about what you should think. <laughs> and <laughs> I think this is true. Like, every, every, if 6% of a social, you are not, then you should, your head examine or something, yes. Uh, uh, but uh, it's not as bad because I'm teaching, uh, I'm doing a lot of public speaking on campuses all over the United States. Uh, the good thing about that is that most students don't know what socialism is. I mean, they, they love it because they think social is some kind of like, like yes, uh, 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 smoking pot and, and singing kumbaya and, and uh, <laughs> other kind of things like this. Uh, something touchy-feely, nice, whatever. Uh, but, um, but this is very sad in general that, the, the, that half of the people in the United States are, uh, were voting and whatnot. Democratic Party right now in the United States uh, became already a socialist party. Uh, a socialist party. Today, um, I, was, uh, I showed Temba, I was posting on a Facebook, governor of West Virginia, Democrat, yeah, he switched the parties. And so I put a, I put a nice tag on this that rats are abandoning um, <laughs> sink, sinking ship, right? Um, but he is a rat, I mean, that, no. <laughs> No doubts about it. <laughs> and he's enjoying. It's not I'm saying that, that Republicans are much better. When I defected to US, Sam Francis was a great libertarian um, journalist, whatnot. He invited me for, for lunch and he said, Yuri, he said, um, um, uh, you should keep in mind we have a two party system. And I was thinking, what he's telling me? I mean, everybody knows this. He said, we have two party system. One party is evil and another stupid. <laughs> and, <laughs> And I said, who are you? He said, I am a stupid one, I'm Republican, I'm Republican. And this is more or less true, right? Uh, that's, uh, that's very, very sad. So sometimes we see, however, this, that, that, uh, that fighting socialism, that socialism will not inevitably win. It was a great, uh, great um, Austrian economist, um, uh, um, Schumpeter, Josef Alois Schumpeter, in 1950, he, he died in 1950, after he wrote a book, uh, Communism, uh, Capitalism and Democracy, in which he was making a point that, that, um, that he is squarely for capitalism. Capitalism is freedom, everything. But socialism is inevitable, his point was. Inevitable because of democracy. Inevitable because of democracy. So I, th I don't think it's inevitable because you can see that the zigzags, you know, you can see the, the, all these amazing changes in South Africa with your new mayors, um, and changes in the United States. Uh, even in France, if you will look at Mr. Macron, I mean, uh, five years ago, he would not have a chance even, be, he would be immediately declared um, what, a capitalist pig or something like that. And, uh, and so these are kind of good changes, however, However, I think that these changes would not be possible without people like ourselves to fight for freedom. That's what, that's what um, Ludwig von Mises, he, he wrote a wonderful essay, if you'll have time, you can easily find it on the World Wide Web. Are we historians of decline? That's the title. Are we historians of decline? And his point is that even if we are, what choices do we have but to fight? What choice do we have that to fight? And I think that I would agree with that completely. If you have any questions or comments, then I would be happy to. Mm -hmm. uh, Vladimir Putin once uh, said that whoever does not miss uh, 
Anybody who does not miss the Soviet Union has no heart. Mm -hmm. You grew up with that your childhood, etc. You also said whoever wants a back has no brain. Mm -hmm. now, how, how would you contrast the, that with say how how Russia has developed since he came? Mm -hmm. uh, the GDP per, per capita, I mean, I mean, went, went up for right. people almost 15 times. It's still not as high as Estonia and all of that, but and went down with the recent recession and the sanctions. But mm -hmm. despite his autocratic tendencies, he's still, mm -hmm. his government and his government is still managed to do some tricks on the hat for a country that was almost written off as completely failed in the late 1990s. Yes, well, Mr. Putin has not my favorite. Definitely, yes, uh, I wrote uh, uh, when he was elected, uh, relatively free elections of 2000, he got 73% of the popular vote. And that's the institution which murdered so, so many. He is a proud member of the KGB. He, he really is proud for his background. And so I wrote an article which pub was published in Russian, in Russia at that time, with self-descriptive title, Meat Voted for a Meat Grinder. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and uh, Mr. Putin is also known that if he doesn't like somebody, their life expectancy tends to drop like a rock. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's why, for example, I'm not, no, Russia is one-sixth of the world territory, so I'm exploring five-sixths. Uh, I don't go, go back there. Mm -hmm. um, the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, uh, there was a quote attributed to Alexander Solzhenitsyn where he said that a large portion or the majority of the Bolsheviks were not even um, ethnic Russians. Is that true? It is true, yes, it is true. Well, Solzhenitsyn is uh, being accused of anti-Semitism all the time. He wrote a book called 200 Years Together, History of, of Jews in Russia. And if you will look at first Soviet government, then uh, there was only one non-Jew non there in the government, and it was Joseph Stalin. And everybody else was, I mean, Lenin, Jewish, Trotsky, Trotsky is real, uh, Lenin's name, Bloom, uh, um, Trotsky was um, um, Bronstein, uh, then Zinoviev was what, Rosenfeld, and, and then all of them were like that. Well, for what reason? Because Jews were, were um, discriminated against in, in the Tsars. Uh, Jews had uh, something called the settlement lines, which would be 100 miles from big cities. They could not. And uh, so that Jews, uh, and Jews were the first to embrace, to embrace Marxism, to embrace Marxism. They had a socialist, uh, socialist uh, party, a Jewish socialist party, it's called Bund. Bund means people. And, um, uh, and so they were, the, they were the, the heart of the Communist Party, of the, of the Lenin's Party, Social Democratic Party. They, they disbanded Bund and then they started this, uh, this Social Democratic Party. And so all of them then, and then Stalin was the only, and Stalin became anti-Semite himself. And, and say in 1939 he already was saying that it's time to clean the synagogue. And uh, he meant the whole Soviet government as a synagogue. And he was murdering a lot of people like Zinoviev and Kamenev and Bukharin and whatnot, uh, who happened also to be Jewish. And then Stalin's idea was that, that that's why he supported the foundation of Israel, that all the Jews would move there, his point was. Uh, however, then he realized that that's a, not a good idea, and so he started the Jewish Autonomous Republic in the Far East a completely unlivable place, so he would dump all the Jewish population there, and they, they would die. Well, the Jews were lucky, Soviet Jews were lucky that Stalin died in the middle of this dream. Uh, but already 56,000 were sent there to, to this Siberia, uh, to this Birobidjan, um, uh, it's called, the, the place. Um, and then also they, um, they had uh, uh, trials of, of Jewish cosmopolitans, they called them. And, uh, and they, the Jewish doctors were accused of, 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 killing, uh, of killing Russians by vaccinations and things like that. Uh, so that was, uh, yeah, so that was pretty. But if you will look at, at uh, uh, 
it's for Jews it's kind of no win kind of thing because they either are accused that they brought this 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 plague upon the country uh, however now they are accused of being uh, of being uh, imperial pro pro, uh, pro american pro whatever um, most Jews that I know of left I mean it's only only I think only dyslexics are still there that's the, the because they have a they have opportunity to I mean Israel is happy to take them U.S. is happy to take them so that's them. Any other questions? Um, or well, I would like to thank you so much for your kind attention and. Thank you.